Yes, our breaking story is that Gary Lineker is to step back from presenting Match of the Day until an agreement is reached on his social media use. This is according to a statement from the BBC, and of course it follows uh, an impartiality row uh, over comments that he made criticising the government's new asylum policy. So Gary Lineker to step back from presenting Match of the Day. Uh, there's more on this story over. Have you spoken to the BBC yet, Gary? take them outside and execute them in front of their families. I mean, just so everyone knows what this is referring to. When Jenna Freaks and Geeks, Dictionary.com defines impartiality as the quality of not being biased or prejudiced, semicolon fairness. For example, we selected the debate moderator based on their reputation for integrity and impartiality. A oh, fuck off. If I'm being honest, I don't believe there is a human being alive that is impartial. Everybody's behavior will be informed by their upbringing, life experience and frame of reference, which will always lead to blind spots, commonly known as conscious and unconscious bias. The biggest problem is the belief of complete impartiality. If the World Cup in Qatar highlighted the inconsistencies of living in a liberal capitalist world, the Gary Lineker and BBC saga has shown us the blatant hypocrisy of what is constituted state-affiliated media in the global north. I don't know who needs to hear this, but anything publicly funded will be an extension of the government's interests, policy and agenda. Guess what? There may be some fine people working at the Home Office that would love to help everybody that arrives at these shores. But government policy means that they will have to prioritise white Christians from Ukraine over brown Muslims from Syria. The same rule should be applied to the BBC, especially the news department. Great Britain has a long and detailed history of being institutionally racist, imperialists, colonisers, war criminals and outright fascists. The BBC has been able to take the most hideous elements of UK government behaviour and wash it so thoroughly, all you can see is liberal political correctness with a sprinkle of heavy condescension. BBC News has perfected the art of dressing up pro-government bias as government criticism with a thick layer of impartiality on top, if that even makes any sense. And if the newsroom strays too far away from the script, then heads will roll regardless of which political party is in government. Just ask Greg Dyke what happened to him when he dared to put a spotlight on Tony Blair and new Labour policy leading up to the invasion of Iraq. But it's not just Barbados that's moving closer no. to China, it's the whole of the Caribbean. I mean, it's, it's the whole investment world. from China has gone up many folds. But so in is the, the whole world. If, if, you, if I look correctly, I think the Chinese hold a large, large percentage of assets within the United States of America and a large amount of their treasuries as well. So for you to focus on the Caribbean or Africa with China, without recognizing the role that China is playing in Europe or in the North Atlantic countries is a bit disingenuous and really reflects more that we are seen as pawns, regrettably, rather than countries with equal capacity to determine our destiny. Perfect. No notes. 10 out of 10. If she wasn't a Republican with a small R, I would say give that queen her crown. So has the BBC ever been impartial? Short answer, no. Long answer, strong no. And some poor mug even went to the trouble of writing an impartiality policy. Section four of the editorial guidelines says in black and white, the BBC is committed to achieving due impartiality in all its output. A oh, fuck off. If the BBC was so committed to impartiality, how come Rishi Sunak was once depicted as a brown superman with potent money powers? and Jeremy Corbyn was depicted as a Russian asset, when in reality, Russian billionaires were flooding money into the Conservative Party like a broken f tap. The BBC also has a policy on social media use for individuals. But who really cares about that when the BBC sports account was liking tweets bashing Gary Lineker? Wikipedia even has a page dedicated to criticism of the BBC, which is a catalogue of the times the BBC was accused of being biased. Some of it is factual, 
Other stuff is stupid and the rest sits in between. If you have time and patience, you should read it. Anyway, I could spend the next 30 seconds repeating the definition of impartiality I gave in the introduction. But the important question is, what does the BBC define as being impartial in all its news output? I believe it's the ability to show two differing views, no matter how uninformed, uneducated and brain broken one of those views are. Simply presenting two opposing views on a topic is fulfilling the promise of impartiality for the BBC. And if they can only provide one view, it has to be right wing and toxic. And you can forget presenting an openly anti-capitalist agenda in a positive light, unless you identify as a Edward Scissorhands tribute act. Examples of the BBC exhibiting impartiality. In 2018, the BBC defended the full broadcast of pedo looking super fascist Enoch Powell's River of Blood speech. This was sold as being justified by the BBC because milk toast liberals would be on hand to provide rigorous journalistic analysis. Me. I'm sure the analysis had Enoch Powell spinning in his grave. Secondly, if someone hides the brutality of Boris Johnson's father, it has to be met with this response from BBC moderator Fiona Bruce. Interview. I'm not. I'm not disputing what you're saying, but just so everyone knows what this is referring to. So Stanley Johnson's uh, wife spoke to a journalist, Tom Bauer, and she said that Stanley Johnson had broken her nose and, and she had ended up in hospital as a result. Stanley Johnson has not commented publicly on that. Friends of his have said it did happen. It was a one-off. Yes. Which is the most freaking bizarre thing to say in retort to a proven case of serious domestic violence. This incident inevitably led to Fiona stepping back as ambassador for a women's refuge. Examples of the BBC preventing accusations of bias. The BBC draws the line at allowing national treasurer David Attenborough to release his fact-based documentary on climate change because it might upset those people that believe trans ideology is after your children, Noah's Ark was real, and the world is actually 3,000 years old. Essentially, this pursuit of impartiality is a zero-sum game. Someone will always scream bias. And I don't think publicly funded organisations should be held to this purity of perfect impartiality. If this was even possible, how comes Tory local authorities act completely different to Labour local authorities? Sometimes. On Tuesday the 7th of March, Gary Lineker tweeted out There is no huge influx. We take fewer refugees than other major European countries. This is just an immeasurably cruel policy directed at the most vulnerable people in language that is not dissimilar to that used by Germany in the 1930s. And I'm out of order. It has been viewed over 3.7 million times. And then the world exploded. Or at least it felt like it did. The tweet starts out with facts which are indisputable. And if he had stopped the tweet at most vulnerable people, I wouldn't be making this video. But making direct parallels between anybody and 1930s Germany is a big no-no. Unless you're Boris Johnson and describing the EU. It's a very good argument against the lack of democracy in the EU. Over the last 2,000 years, people have made repeated attempts to unify Europe by force. The EU is a very different project, but it is profoundly anti-democratic. And that's why we should vote leave on June 23rd. Thank you. Or Lord Sugar and posting infantile memes about Jeremy Corbyn. Like Gary Lineker, Lord Sugar is a freelancer. As was Jeremy Clarkson when he worked for the BBC and assaulted the Irish producer over a cold cut of beef. But if what Gary wrote was so bad, how comes Jeremy Clarkson was allowed to say on live TV, striking workers should be shot? Have them all shot. <laughs> while being a Top Gear host and faced zero repercussions. And how comes this tiny man with a massive head was allowed to post this racist? What about that magical time Emily Maitlis, an actual BBC Newsnight presenter, innocently asked whether Labour could stage a coup against Jeremy Corbyn? Now, I'm not sure whether the fact Emily works in news means she cannot express personal opinions on politics. But this rule definitely does not apply to football highlight man Gary Lineker. And the BBC stupidly tied themselves up in knots trying to pin a crime on Gary Lineker 
that he did not commit. Gary Lineker is not a perfect victim, given he has posted tweets like this in the past, all of which fucking suck. But he is a victim in this situation, and the solidarity shown by his work colleagues is something to behold. Big up to Ian Wright, Alan Shearer, Alex Scott, and Jermaine Genus. And also showing how much of a classy geezer he is, Jeremy Corbyn showed support despite Gary wanting to put him in the bin. But Jeremy also reminded people the focus should be on other things and not this circus. Sort of come down like a ton of bricks on Gary Lineker. And whilst I support what Gary said, and I think he's a decent human being in the way he's put it and said it, unfortunately, the whole debate now is shifting on to Gary and the BBC and ignoring the issue of this, I think, disgraceful piece of legislation that Parliament's about to debate on Monday. There's Even serial liar and war criminal Alistair Campbell explains the awkward position the BBC finds themselves in. Alan Sugar did tweets about Jeremy Corbyn during Corbyn's leadership of the Labour Party and the rows about anti-Semitism, which were a thousand times worse than anything Gary Lineker has said. However, Mr Potato Head Andrew Neil thought the BBC made the right decision. This is the same Potato Head that was chairman for the Spectator magazine throughout his tenure for the BBC. The same magazine that had Boris Johnson as editor for six years. Personally, I don't give a shit how impartial or tough your interviewing style is if the publication you head up puts out headlines like this. So please, for the love of God, go kill yourself. Tories were naturally absolutely fuming. And things got worse when they finally read what Gary wrote. There were other people that understood Gary's sentiment, but disagreed with the comparison with Nazi Germany because Suella targeting refugees is targeting people from other countries, whereas Nazi Germany targeted Jewish people that were German citizens. Which actually made my head explode. What a resourceful way to say you don't care about modern day refugees, along with admitting you don't count the Jews murdered in Poland, Ukraine and elsewhere during World War II. Suella Braverman was understandably upset, not because she is the face of a fascist government policy, but because Gary should avoid calling her a Nazi when she has a Jewish husband. I mean the hubris of this fucker. I can't imagine being called a Nazi and instead of saying how I wasn't using the language of Nazi Germany, I hide behind the fact I have a Jewish spouse. Terminally online leftists took the opportunity to scream Gary Lineker challenged the establishment which meant he was now receiving the Jeremy Corbyn treatment, calling attention to the fact that they now know the front doors of both Jeremy and Gary's houses. But I would also add Dominic Cummins house to that list. As much as I hate Dominic, he did try to take on Boris Johnson's government after they threw him to the wolves. The Labour Party acted as they always do under Sir Keir Rodney Starmer. Initially they came out swinging at Gary Harder than the Tories, calling him a complete shitbag weasel prick. Don't agree with what he said, I don't think it was the right thing to say. I think that's a matter for the BBC, but I don't think that what he said was right, I don't think it's the right thing to say. And after seeing the mood of the public and BBC colleagues, Labour performed a U-turn your driving instructor would be proud of. BBC is not acting impartially by caving in to Tory MPs who are complaining about Gary Lineker. They've got this one badly wrong and now they're very, very exposed. Starmer ran to the front of the crowd, turning around and asking, Would you kids like to come with me? Sounds good to me. Let's go. What a tit. I wonder if Labour under Keir has ever had an original idea. The rule of law is the foundation for everything. Margaret Thatcher called it the first duty of government. And she was right about that. Not enough people are labelled fascists for my liking. If it was up to me, I'll be handing out fascist badges like parking tickets. That's because many people are openly using fascist language in everyday discourse. I truly understand why people often draw comparisons with the Nazis in the first instance. They were considered the worst fascists and nobody wants to be considered the worst at anything. 
which also explains why people are more worried about being labeled a Nazi than actually acting like a Nazi. So in essence, the biggest problem with any argument that features the word Nazi is that everything else becomes white noise as everyone focuses on that single word. So here is my suggestion. Whenever someone is talking like a fascist, acting like a fascist or implementing fascist policies, instead of calling them a Nazi, which will completely derail the conversation, here is a list of alternative metaphors. You are acting like Franklin D. Roosevelt's America 1942 to 1946. Call me crazy, but you are starting to resemble General Pinochet's Chile 1973 to 1990. Why do I get the feeling you wouldn't feel out of place cracking the whip for King Leopold II in the Congo 1885 to 1908. This is awkward because you're acting like the Japanese in China during the 1930s. I'm not trying to be funny but this colonial mindset is what got over 100 Algerians killed in the heart of Paris by French authorities. Do us a favour, stop acting like the British in Kenya during the 1950s. Do us a favour, stop acting like the British in India during the 1940s. Do us a favour, stop acting like the British in Ireland any time between now and the 1840s. Actually it might be easier to see how bad Britain was if you read this page yourself. But you get my point, everyone's a fascist. And the British establishment has always been very sympathetic to fascist ideology. There's a reason the British spies were paying Mussolini a weekly wage and the BBC kept Nigel Farage on a permanent tour of their studios with reoccurring appearances on Have I Got News For You and Question Time. Did you know Nigel has the ninth highest number of appearances on Question Time? Never elected a f***ing MP in the UK. 35 shows! Anyway, there are many examples in human history that equal fascism and we can be a bit creative and put the Nazi analogy to bed once and for all. But wait, there's more. On the basis of these definitions and its research, Human Rights Watch finds that Israeli authorities are committing the crimes against humanity of apartheid and persecution. Is it right that this kind of political uh, uh, debate should be entering the world of sport? Should Gary Lineker, would Gary Lineker be the right person to talk about the LGBTQ rights and human rights in Qatar? We can't have it both ways. We accept that. So why can't he talk about it here? So this is the point I'm making about impartiality. And we're saying that stick to sports. But when we want to criticize other countries or other religions, we then say, yes, let the sports people come out and talk about that. But don't criticize what goes on in this country. We can't have it both ways. So where does that leave the BBC and them wanting to be impartial regardless of who is sitting in number 10 Downing Street? Of course I could sit here and revel over the times Jeremy Paxman gave politicians of all stripes the business. Do you seriously expect to be leader of your party? I think that those in the party who will understand that there is a need for tough decisions to be taken... To understand what the point is here. The point is people think you're just not tough enough. Well, uh, let, let me tell you, right? Uh, let me tell you, okay, Come on. let me tell you. But you could always tell he had a stiffy speaking to Boris Johnson or Russell Brand because he found them fun and the politics they both advocated for either did not affect a rich man like him or they weren't possible in a country like England. And the facts still remain. The reason Lord Sugar could tweet this about Jeremy Corbyn and Boris Johnson could call the EU Nazis is because the targets have either been outright leftists or perceived as liberal or leftists. Remember, we have idiots in our media class that are still spreading the myth of Hitler being a leftist in 2023. So calling leftists the N word is totally acceptable. However, Gary Lineker calling out the fascist policies of a hard right government and calling them Nazis is just not cricket. What the f***? To be honest, I understand why the BBC is not fully impartial. Have you ever tried to use neutral language for more than an hour? Things become stale very quickly. Here is a list of eight phrases that are considered biased now. Coloured people, digital native, confined to a wheelchair, chairman, man the stockroom, mankind, peanut gallery, spirit animal, homosexual, 
I think we can all agree those are some of the best phrases, especially coloured people. Replacing these phrases with more neutral language is not very fun and it will leave you wanting to harm someone. So to keep up the appearance of impartiality, BBC News has to frame content in a spicy way to trigger emotions. Apparently, only professional athletes should be able to flee the Taliban. And how dare junior doctors ask for more money during a cost of living crisis? Greedy Marxists. And the BBC does this because they know the Tories are itching to sell them to the highest bidder. Not that the current chairman, <clears throat> I mean chairperson, would be bothered. How come the chairman of the BBC, Richard Sharp, the chairman, is somebody who donated £400,000 to the Conservative Party? Someone who has helped arrange an £800,000 loan for the former Prime Minister, uh, Boris Johnson. If the BBC wants to justify their licence fee, they need to show that they are still value for money and people are still watching them. But they won't be able to do that by alienating the right, centre and left of the political spectrum. Which is probably why the BBC was so quick to apologise over the Gary Lineker saga publicly and privately. As a keen sports fan, I know, uh, like everyone, that to miss programming is a real blow and I am sorry about that. We are working very hard um, to resolve the situation. Um, this one was fun to make because I think I've been slowly realizing um the issues that everyone has with the bbc um before i used to worship at the altar of the bbc without question um but especially their news content is is very very weird and and the double standard that they have with certain pre presenters and i don't even think it is over certain presenters i think it depends who those presenters are targeting. So like if you're Jeremy Clarkson, you can target, um, yeah, you can basically just target striking workers. Um, if, well, Gary Lineker before can say whatever he wants about Jeremy Corbyn, a Newsnight presenter like Emily can speak about coups and yeah, and it's all fine, but Whoever is in government cannot be specific targets of presenters unless you're doing it satirical like on um, Have I Got News For You or what used to be Mock The Week. But yeah, um, I guess I did want to speak about other stuff like um, I guess Suella Braverman, I wanted to expand more on that but I just didn't get the opportunity to do it or fit it into this um, video. Um, so also I wanted to speak more about how ridiculous um, Sakir Starmer is. He's, he's such a, he's such a blueberry. He's weird, 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 weird guy. But um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed this video. Um, please, please, please. Um, yeah. Leave me a comment down below. Um, I would love to read them. Um, please don't forget to like and subscribe and forward this video to anyone that you feel might benefit um, from watching it. Um, yeah, I think upcoming videos will be centered around um, public health, um, well, health in general under capitalism, and um, yeah, whether it can really be addressed under the current economic system we have but um yeah so that's going to take me a little longer to put together but um yeah hopefully i can fit in some other stuff uh, between them because um yeah i saw this topic come up and yeah it just it just automatically made me think okay yeah got me excited about making a video about it um so yeah if it takes me a really long time to do this video on um, capitalism and public health, maybe maybe something else will uh, attract my attention and I'll be able to do a quick video about it. But um, yeah, 
again if you've listened up to this point thank you thank you thank you and i will see you very very soon okay bye